These are five important check marks you should be able to cross off if you consider yourself a real Christian. You stick around to the end, there's a sixth one and a sixth sign that shows that God has really touched your life. It's going to be a good one. You're going to want to watch this today. It's going to be a good one. Thank you, Lord. Let's see who pops in today. It's going to be a good one today, Lord. And if you're watching this on Instagram, before we get started, if you, want, if you would like to like and subscribe and share the video, that would be really helpful to our channel. And if you would like to donate, I'm going to have a donate link at the very bottom. Praise the Lord. Let's see who joins in today. And if not, we'll start in about 20 seconds. Hope you are having a wonderful day. All right, let's get started. So this is the first one. This is the first sign that you love God. That's the first sign. Do you love God? Are you in love with Jesus Christ? And so we're gonna to turn to Luke 10, I believe. Yes, we're turning to Luke 10. If you would like to turn with me, this is Luke 10, 25 through 28. Praise the Lord. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And a lawyer was someone who was like very, they knew all the law, which is the first five books. Of the, they were experts in the law. They had all of it memorized. And so this guy was like, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Because he wanted to test Jesus. So this guy knew all of it, but so did Jesus. And so this guy, he was trying to be smart. He was trying to test Jesus. And he said to him, what is written in the law? What is your... Um, says, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And this is what Jesus said to him. He said to him, what is, your written, uh, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So what did you get from the law? So he said and answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. So Jesus says that if we love the Lord and our neighbor as ourself, we shall be saved. So do you love God today? Do you love God today? So we're gonna to turn to Luke 14, and this is, this is what Jesus says. 26, 27. If anyone comes after or if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life, he also he also he or life also he cannot be my disciple. So Jesus, if you read this directly, it says, you have to hate everybody else. And if you don't, you can't follow me. But that's not saying actually go hate your mother. He's saying love me so much that when someone looks at your life and they see how much you love Jesus, they should be like, oh my gosh, they hate their father and mother compared to him. That's what he means. Love Jesus so much that your friends and family think that, that you hate them because you're spending so much time with God. See, God is not a person when Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit. He says he, he, when he comes, will bring into remembrance all the things that I've taught you. Spend time with Jesus. He's a person. He walked around just like us. Isn't that crazy? He says, they, it says that Jesus can sympathize with our weaknesses because he was tempted in all points as we are. Isn't that crazy? Jesus can understand our pain and our hurt. Yes, he's God, but he came in the flesh and dwelt among us. Isn't that amazing that we have a God that can actually understand our hurting and our pain? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So this is what Matthew 10, 34 through 39 says. And this is kind of reiterating what Jesus just said in Luke 14, I believe. Yes. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves sons or daughter, son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not fall, take up his cross and follow me 
and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So if you hate everything else, but you love God, you will find your life. That is what Jesus is asking us to do. Renounce everything that you used to know about life and become a new person. Jesus is saying, pick up your cross. So when Jesus picked up his cross, he was glorified on the third day. He rose again. He became a new creation. So when you pick up your cross daily, you die to what you used to be. Paul tells us to be a living sacrifice to God. Be a living sacrifice. And this is what... So the whole point... The whole point is that you need to love God. This, this is the first step. This is the, whole, this is the first step to being a Christian. Love God. You don't want to follow something. You want to do something that you don't love. That's why people don't do certain jobs. That's why some people are like, I only want to do a job that I love. And I do this because I love God and this is what he's asked me to do. Just like if you, your father asks you to do something, you love your dad. You love your parents. So you do what you ask them to because you love them. And if anyone thinks that he knows, any, or knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this is the one known by him. So if you love God, you are known by God. That's why Jesus told those in particular people, he said, Lord, Lord, have we not cast the demons out in your name? Have we not healed the sick in your name? But he says, I don't know you. Because they didn't actually love God. You can do all the signs and miracles without loving God. You can have the Holy Spirit. But if you want to be known by God, you have to love him. And that doesn't, that doesn't mean just sing praises to him. That doesn't mean just sing to him. That means spend time with him. When you spend time with your brother or sister or your friends, you spend time with them, you sit alone with them, and you talk to them. You talk about regular things. So he said, God spoke something to my heart today. He said, yes, I'm your Lord. I'm your Lord, but I'm also your friend. I'm also your friend. You're not serving me just as God. You're serving me as a friend. Jesus says in Matthew, uh, John 15, he says, if you do what I tell you and you keep my commandments, you are, we are friends. I'm friends with you. So Jesus is not only our Lord, but he's also our friend, which is the greatest part about serving God is that you actually have a friend in Christ. He's not just someone that you serve. He's not just like, he's not just your master. He's your friend. He's your best friend. He understands you. He's always with you and he comforts you. When I'm feeling my lowest, when I'm feeling at my lowest, God is in my ear. He's saying, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm always here. He's holding my hand. He's with me. He's with me now. He's present in this room with me. And I have faith in that. My friend doesn't let me down. So when I'm in trouble, I know that my friend doesn't let me down because I know I have a friend in heaven. Because I know him and he knows me. John 10, 37 says, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. He takes care of his sheep. Second step. Second sign, are you reborn? So the first step is, do you love God? And the proof that you love God is that you just spend time with Him. And when you spend time with people, you actually end up being more like them. There's a lot of things that I do and say that I repeated from a lot of my friends. There's a lot of things that I say that my brothers say. And there's a lot of things that he says that I say because we hang out with each other and we know each other a lot. And there's, a, there's something that friends do, and I don't know if you do this, but there's something that I do with my friends. And it's kind of like, like this look, you know each other. You know what each other want. You know each other, like, you know what you're like. You know what their favorite thing is. I know what my favorite, my brother's favorite snack is. I know what my parents' favorite snack is. Do we know God like this? Is he, our, is he really our friend like that? Like, do we know God? Do we spend time with him? I used to go hang out with my friends all the time, constantly, all the time. I used to call my second home. Is your prayer closet or wherever you seek God, is that your second home? Are you obsessed with that secret home? Are you so obsessed with that secret home that people actually get annoyed because you, they feel like they haven't seen you all day? My parents get annoyed because I spend so much time in my closet with God. And that's not bragging. It's, I'm just reiterating my point. I'm saying that I actually do what the scripture says. Spend time with God. And that's, that's why. Because when you spend that much time with God, people get annoyed because they feel like they haven't seen you in years. Not years, but they have, they're like, I haven't seen you in all day. Yeah, because I've been with God. 
And the more you hang out with God, the more you become like him. That's why Jesus spent so much time with God. It said that he spent all night up on the mountain with God. Are we spending all night with God? Are we staying up like God? Are we, like the way that I used to party, the way that I used to do things, the way that I used to do drugs, I do, I do now greater in the kingdom of God. We just go from darkness to light. We just go from darkness to light. So if you're a partier, go party for Jesus. If you're a singer, go sing for Jesus. You don't have to be lukewarm. You can still be as passionate as you were in the world. It's just now it's for Jesus and now it's for life. It's for eternity. It's for eternity. So are we reborn? And what is it like to be reborn? I'm gonna, re I'm gonna explain that a little bit. It says, this man came to Nicodemus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. So Jesus, they knew that God, God was with Jesus because of the signs he did. And this is how prophets and evangelists in this time proved that God was with them because they did signs. In Acts 8, there was, there was a sorcerer who did signs and miracles. Signs and miracles, and they believed that he was from God. Signs and miracles prove that God is in you. And that's still today. And now it doesn't say anywhere in Acts that the signs should stop. Paul says that tongues should cease, prophesying ceases. But if I speak in tongues right now, eventually after 30 minutes, I'm going to stop speaking in tongues, but he doesn't say anything about signs. Love does not cease. That's what Paul says. Just like this video is not going to go on forever. It's the same way. Signs aren't supposed to stop. He's, Jesus says, oh, we'll get into that later. I'm getting ahead. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So he says, most assuredly I say to you, unless, so Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter a second time and hit into his mother's womb and be born? Most assuredly I say to you, one, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of, of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but I cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So what is it like being born of the Spirit? Being reborn. Being freshly born. When you're born out of a womb, you know nothing. You're fresh. Everyone's like, oh, baby. And you like start walking on your arms and legs, and that's how your Christian walk is. But eventually you have to mature. That's why Paul says... When I was a child, I did childish things. And now that I'm an adult, I do adult things. And that's the same thing in a Christian walk. You start with simple stuff. You start with baby steps. You start with baby steps. You, you get fed by your parents. You get fed by other people. But eventually, you start being the one that's helping other people. You start being the one who's doing greater things. You start with an A in kindergarten. You start with A, B, C. D, you start with simple things, but eventually you're going to be writing sentences and paragraphs and stories and books. It's the same way with the Christian life. And eventually, sometimes we're the one that teaches others how to walk. This is how we get reborn. We have to walk. And when you're reborn, this, this Bible starts, you start reading the Bible and you're like, okay, I've done that before. Okay, this I can I can I've seen this in my life before without reading the Bible. Cuz the the it says that the word of God was inspired by the spirit of God. So when you're walking in the spirit, this Bible starts becoming your life without you even trying. That's why Paul says those who walk in the spirit aren't under the law. Naturally, this book starts becoming a book that reflects your life. Naturally. It's amazing. It's one of the greatest things. It's it's mind-boggling. I'll read stuff in the Old Testament and I'll be like, when like they're seeing visions or something else and I'll be like, wait, I've had that experience before. And that's what it's like being in the spirit. You start experiencing spiritual things. So if you're saying you're reborn, but there's no spiritual manifestation, you might not be reborn, dude. If you're not hearing from God, it says that who can, who can know the things of God except the spirit of God? So if it's, 
it's hard for me to wrap my head around someone that says they're reborn, but they don't actually understand the things of God. See, just because you read the Bible and pray doesn't mean you're reborn. I've had someone recently tell me, what happened to you? What happened to you? You did a whole 180. What happened to you? I had people when I got reborn tell me, I don't recognize you. I, had, I went up to one of my friends and I scared them because they didn't recognize me. One of my football coaches that I played football for for two years didn't recognize me. People don't recognize you when you're reborn. That's why Jesus, when he got glorified, his disciples didn't recognize him at first until he called them by name. There has to be some kind of physical, spiritual manifestation. You can't, there's no title. That's why we shouldn't give titles to ourselves. Are you reborn? What is the step for being reborn? What is the first step? And this is the first step that I took, and I'm gonna give a quick story. Then he said to him, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And follow me. That's why Peter said, when Jesus was like, are you leaving too? Paul, Peter was like, you have the words of eternal life to where shall we go? Because they had nowhere else to go. That's why, <laughs> that's why Nicodemus said, how can a man enter him into his womb? and to his mom again. You can't go back. You can't go, once you're reborn, you, I have all my friends' numbers deleted. I've deleted all the numbers, I, everything, all the connections that I had, it's completely done. I can't go back to my old life. That's what being reborn is like. Hey Felix, how are you doing? That's what being reborn is like. Everything becomes new. You have to deny yourself and pick up your cross daily and follow Christ. You have to deny yourself and follow Christ. Deny what your flesh wants. That's why fasting is so important because you're actually denying the food that your flesh wants. And the more that you fast, the more you're able to actually conquer over what your flesh wants. Deny yourself and follow Jesus. Picking up your cross, is, it hurts. That's where they got... That's why, do you realize that dying on a cross is the most painful death? That's where they got the word excruciating. Dying on a cross is not easy and neither is following Christ. So if it doesn't hurt, then you're not doing it right. Just like working out. If I worked out and I, didn't, I wasn't sore after, then I wasn't doing it right. There's suffering. We must suffer for Christ. And you, when you're walking in the spirit, you understand why you're doing it. That's what Second Corinthians five seventeen is, or I said sorry, not is. Thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Therefore, if any was in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So when I started, when I got reborn. I stopped cussing, I stopped biting my nails, I used to stop biting my nails, I used to bite my nails constantly. I stopped doing the old things that I did. I used to play um, video games and I used to curse at my video games. I used to just yell all the time. Is there a transform transformation, transformation? Paul actually says, you are a new creation. Are you a new creature? Are you a new person? Have you become a new creation in Christ? Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with, by Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. When someone sees you, do they recognize Christ in you? Do you realize that Paul, when Peter was going around healing people, he was doing so many great things, and Christ, he was so filled with the Spirit of God that people were literally getting on their mattresses just to be healed by his shadow. Now, I'm not saying that's at the level we should be at, but people should be able to recognize that Christ is in you. God is in you. Nicodemus could recognize that God was in Jesus. He says no one can do these signs if God is not in him. Can people recognize visibly and spiritually that you are new, that Christ is in you? Is Christ in us? Yes, you might have the Holy Spirit, but that doesn't mean he's actually living inside of you. He might just have a house, a vacant house. It's, that's what the church is like right now. It's vacant. The Holy Spirit has been gone for a while now. And what happened when Samson, when the Holy Spirit left Samson, he was put in chains by the enemy and he was tied up. Are you tied up by the enemy today? 
Because I know my God breaks every chain. And what, hap what happened when the Holy Spirit filled Samson again? He broke those chains and took everyone out with him. Now, we're not, that's not what I'm calling you to do, but <laughs> that's just an example. Praise the Lord. This is what Psalms 27, 8 says. And when you're reborn, there's nothing else that you want but God. Your only desire is God. And this is, this has been my prayer. I read this when I pray. I say, when you said, so, so uh, sorry, David was talking about how he wanted, he, his desire for God was so great. He said, Lord, I, do, I, I desire to be in the house of God for the rest of my life. Never, he, was, he never wanted to leave. And God, this is what God said to him. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. He said, your face, I, Lord, Lord, I will seek. Now, how do you seek God's face? Well, how do you seek anything? How do you seek to be successful? You work at it. You spend a lot, a lot of time doing it, but it's not the same with Christianity. With Christianity, it's seeking God in prayer. A lot of fasting. God, I want to know you. That's that's what your prayer should be. Lord, I want to know you. Lord, I want to know your face. Lord, when I get up to heaven, I want you to be ready when I get up there. Not that I want there to be a red carpet because the only, there's only one person that deserves a red carpet and only one person deserves a crown, but I'm saying that God should know us. And all, does God know us, but does the enemy have your name on a hit list? Is Satan like, yo, dude, this guy is... We need to take this guy out. Because that's what, that, that's what they were doing to Paul. That's what they were doing to Jesus. Paul said that I was hindered by Satan. Satan was sent specifically attacking Peter. He, <laughs> Jesus said to Peter, 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 Satan has been asking for you. Is, is Satan asking for you? Is that how much like trouble you are giving? Is that how much trouble you're giving the kingdom of darkness today? Now, that's not what we're seeking, but when you seek God, wherever God is, the devil wants to be as well because he wants to shut it down. Praise the Lord. Are you seeking God? Is there, is there a spiritual hunger? See, when the Spirit is living on, on the inside of you, you have to feed it just like you feed your baby, just like you feed your dog, just like you feed yourself. Are you feeding your spirit? Are you walking in the spirit? That's the third thing. So one and two, do you love God? Are you reborn? And number three, are you walking in the spirit? Are you walking in the spirit? Galatians 5, 16, this is what it says. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna read out a list that Paul goes over. And these, these are some attributes or characteristics of someone that is not walking in the spirit. And then he contradicts it with things that show that you are walking in the Spirit. He says, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the Spirit lusts against the flesh, and the Spirit against the flesh. So the flesh and the lust are at war against another. They fight against another. They don't want the same things, I promise you. Because the devil uses the flesh, just like he used Adam and Eve. He said, if you eat at this tree, their flesh wanted that. Their spirit didn't want that, because God didn't want that. Are you thinking about what your spirit wants today? Are you thinking about what your spirit wants? Oh, maybe the Holy Spirit doesn't want me watching this movie. Oh, maybe the Holy Spirit doesn't want me watching this show. Oh, maybe the Holy Spirit doesn't want me reading this magazine. Or maybe the Holy Spirit doesn't want me eating this. Or maybe the Holy Spirit doesn't want me doing this. Or is that on our mind constantly? Is the Holy Spirit, managing the Holy Spirit, the gift of God, on our mind today? Are we taking care of that treasure? Paul says that we have, he has stored this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We're in jars of clay. And God is molding us, but we have to allow him to mold us because once the jars of clay start refusing to be molded, they get thrown out. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you with, wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So the Spirit contradicts what our flesh wants. Your flesh doesn't want to read. I promise you, every time that you're drawn into prayer or to read, it's by the Spirit of God. Because those are spiritual things. I promise you, my flesh wants to do anything else but fast. I promise you. But my spirit desires it. My spirit desires to crucify the flesh. Jesus asked me to crucify the flesh. 
So that's what I'm doing. I'm doing what Jesus said. Because he's the one who saved me and he's the one who continually saves me over and over again. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery. And sorcery, the same Greek word for sorcery is drugs. Are you doing drugs today? Are you smoking? Are you drinking? Are you doing these things? Are you partying with people? Are you hanging out with people that you should not hang out with? Paul says not to hang out with these people. Reveries, murderers, gossipers. Are you hanging out with people that God wants you to hang out with? See, when I got saved, God had me stop hanging out with certain people because he knew that if I didn't stop hanging out with them, that I was going to become like them. So whoever you hang out with, I'm going to say this today. Whoever you hang out, are hanging out with is who you're going to be like. So if you're hanging out with people that are smoking and drinking, you're going to be smoking and drinking. If you're hanging out with God, you're going to become like God. That's why Paul said, separate yourself from these people. God has called you to be holy and separate from people. See, when Paul got saved, he was with people. But they, they heard Jesus' voice, but they didn't see the light. When Daniel and Daniel 10 saw Jesus come up to him, he was the only one who saw it. So sometimes when we get called, sometimes we have this mindset that, oh, my friends are called too. That's not the case, and I learned that very hard. I had a, when I had my vision, I saw two other people with me. I assumed it was my two best friends at the time, and I was very wrong. I know who they are now. But I assumed that God was going to save my friends as well, and I was very wrong. But that doesn't mean that I don't pray for them every single day. We must be holy and separate, and then it, take, it takes a lot of... It takes a lot of hurting. It does. I promise you. Hatred. Do you have hatred for other people? Are we loving other people? Contentions. Jealousies. Are you jealous of other people? I find, And I'm preaching to myself. I find myself falling into these traps. All these things are common to people. I'm not, I'm not some holy, like, general, okay? I'm struggling with these things too. Like, I'm teaching this because I had to learn this too. Selfish ambitions, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions. You must renounce self. You must renounce the works of the flesh completely if you want to follow God. You can't do these things. Selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you practice these things, see, there's a difference between a sin and an iniquity. When David sinned against God, when he slept with that, that guy's wife and killed him, that was a sin. But what Paul did when he was killing Christians, that was an iniquity. It was a repeated sin. If we are doing these, it is one thing to sin, but it, it is an, another thing to practice sin. See, God is not going to take all of our sins away. He forgives them. He washes them away. That's why Jesus died. Because without Jesus, it would be hard to be, live a sinless life. And we could not all come to God. But now, do you realize that, I'm going to go over this later, but do you realize that prophets like Elijah and Ezekiel so desired, and David, David desired to have the gift that you have. The spiritual gifts that you have, David desired. They prophesied about these things. Do you understand? Joel prophesied of these. He says, in the latter days, the Spirit will pour out. He, God will pour out His Spirit on all flesh. They so desired to see the things that you see, that do the things that you do and have the ability to do, that they would do anything to do these things. And you have this gift and you're not actually taking care of it. You have things that David wants. You have things that Solomon wanted. And Solomon had everything he could ever want. Can you picture that? You, the spirit that you have on the inside of you, Solomon wanted to have. As rich and as powerful as Solomon was, he wants to have what you have. David wants to have what you have, and he won everything. He was always victorious, and he wants to have what you have. Think about that. We have the ability now through the Holy Spirit to be holy just as Jesus is holy. Live holy. Choose to be like God. It says in 2 Timothy, it says that they will have a godly appearance, but they will deny the power that can make them like God. Are you denying the power that can make you like God? And what did Nicodemus say about God? What was Jesus like? 
what was Jesus like? What made what made Jesus like God? Because he did miracles. What's up, my friend? How you doing? <laughs> what made Jesus like God? Well, Nicodemus, he said, you, no one can have God inside of him. The miracles you do, it, it, they're impossible without having God inside of him. So when we do miracles, when we preach the good word of God, it proves that we have the spirit of Christ. Paul says, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. But he says, he goes down to say, and he says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such there is no law. And those who are of Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So when we, when we walk in Christ, <laughs> what's up, my friend? How you doing? How's your conference, my friend? You want to join my call? All right, we'll keep going. So when we have these things, when we crucify our flesh and desire, these things come out of us. My friend, you want to do a video another time? So I think there's a misunderstanding. Christians, people outside of the Christianity and the Christian life, they say, they look at the things that you cannot do, but they don't look at the things that you can do. And what can we do? Jesus says that we have the power to heal the sick, to cast out demons. That's what we can do. They can't do that. They look at the things, the one thing that we cannot do, and that is to live in the world. So these things, when we come to Christ, we lose all these fleshly desires when we crucify the flesh and we gain all of this love for people. We gain all this love for other people. And this is what Revelation 22, 14 through 15 says. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life. You want to come on here, my friend? They may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the, uh, the gates in this, into the city. So when you, he says, blessed are those who do his commandments, not list them. He says, blessed are those who do him, do them. My friend. I accepted your invitation, my friend. He says, blessed are those who do him. That's why Jesus says, be doers, not listeners of the law. Be doers. If you're a doer, you are blessed. And you have the right to the tree of life. You have the right to heaven if you do what Jesus says to do. But Paul says, if you walk by the spirit, you're not under the law. And you do what he commands you naturally. But he says, but outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexual immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. So we can be Christian and we can be lying to ourselves. In 2 Kings 22, 2 Kings 22, there were false prophets and they were so convinced that they were real prophets. They, had brought, they brought in a real prophet and he prophesied against the king and they this, this other prophet shook him by the shoulders and he said, how did the spirit of God come out of me into you and prophesy? You have to know for yourself, you cannot determine whether or not someone is real or fake. You have to take care of your own faith. Now, if God puts you in a, in a position to be a shepherd, that's a whole different thing. He, he, he told Peter that he wants to shepherd his sheep. But unless God does not put you, but if God puts you in that position, that is your role. But until that, 
You have to take care of the genuineness of your own faith. Take care of the prize and the treasure that God has given you. Someone say amen. And this is what Galatians 5.15 says. And then I'm going to tell a story that is going to illustrate how we can overcome the works of the flesh. I'm so glad I'm saved. Okay, so this is what it says. So when we follow all the commandments, this is what it comes up to. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. Just wait. So all the law, all of it is fulfilled in this one, this one thing. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. So when you follow the law, the result of following God is love for others. On fire for love for others. Do you notice that Jesus, every time he healed someone, almost every single time, it was someone that was poor or weak or tax collectors or sinners. It was always someone that was downcast, lowly. Christ came for the sinner. He loved others. Jesus says, I have loved you just as my father has loved you. But this is my commandment that you love one another. That's what he said. That is the most loving God. Love is the most important commandment. Love for all things. Love for all things. But love doesn't often look like the way that we think it does. Love is not all huggy and kissy and like high fivey pancake Christianity, okay? This, I'm going to show you love. I'm going to show you an example of love. Love is honest. It, it, most love is represented in different ways. Love can also be represented in just being, is telling the truth. You cannot have love without following Christ because Christ is love. Christ is love. Christ made love and he is love. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch and was, I withstood him to his face. Paul saying, when Peter came to Antioch, I withstood him to his face. He got up in his face and he said, Peter, you're doing something that I don't like, dude. And people are like, oh, well, you should come to people one-on-one. -on -one. But that's actually not what it says. I, you need to keep reading. And he was to be blamed. For certain men came from James. He would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew them and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with them. So even Barnabas carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, so what they were doing is that they were saying, eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, they would withdraw themselves. So they were telling Paul and they were telling them to do certain things that they were actually not doing themselves. This is why we have to be doers of the word and not just hearers, because sometimes we can preach the word, but not actually do it in the background. And so Paul saw this. And he was like, wait, hold on, dude. This is not okay with me. And he confronted Peter and I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of the Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? So if I'm up here, if I'm live streaming, telling you to be like Christ, but I don't actually live as Christ, I'm a hypocrite. And what I say is a lie. But what made Jesus, what made the truth of the gospel, the truth is because our Christ rose from the dead. Christ rising from the dead made everything he said, tr what he said was true. That's what made it true, that he actually proved that what he was saying was true. So he's saying, if you say to live a certain way, but you don't actually live the way that you say, you're a hypocrite. Who are of Jews, who are Jews by nature, not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ Jesus. You're not justified, but why the law says. So if it says, love your neighbor as yourself, you're not justified because you love neighbor, your neighbor, neighbors as yourself, as the, though that is a great contribution. You are justified because you have faith in God. And God, when you follow God and you have faith in God, you will naturally love others. You will have a natural love for others because Christ will live on the inside of you. And when Christ lives on the inside of you, you can feel what he feels for other people. You begin to feel the love that he has for other people. 
And that doesn't happen overnight. It says that you are a temple of the Holy Ghost. But do you know, it, do you know how long it took Solomon to build his temple? Years. Years. And I'm not saying that it takes a long time to build the temple of the Holy Ghost, but it must be completed. And when you're completed as a holy temple, the, holy, the, the presence of God can come in there. You understand? But Christ has to be that cornerstone. You understand? Christ has to be that first cornerstone piece. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Oh, this is good preaching. But by faith in Christ Jesus, even we, thank you, Holy Ghost, have believed in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be just, justified. But why, but why, if, but if we, but if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners. Is Christ, therefore, a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if, if, I, if I build again those things of which I destroy, go back to smoking. If I go back to watching pornography, I'm not only a backslider, but I'm also transgressing. But that doesn't make tr Christ what Christ did not true. It means that my vessel is weak. It means that I need to get back with God. What did David do when he sinned against God? He went back to God. He went back to God. But what happened when Saul disobeyed God? He went to a witch. That's why it says rebellion is, a sin, is as a sin of witchcraft. For I, I though, the, for through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. Jesus Christ's baptism, it, his death was a baptism into a new life. It was a cleansing of a new life. And we, when we believe and we walk in the death of Christ, the life of Christ may also be manifested in our bodies. <laughs> Hallelujah. Number four, do we love others? Do we love others? And we've been kind of going over this. Do we love others? And this is what 1 Corinthians 13 says. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but I have, no, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. So if you have no love for others, you're just, you're just a sound. And there's no rhythm. But Christ, when he, when he chose Paul, he said, to Ananias, he said, I'm going to use him as an instrument. I'm going to use him. I'm going to play him. We're part of a symphony. We're, we're a part of the body of Christ. And when we all work together, we sound like a symphony. See, we have the singers. Those are the cherubim. But there also has to be instruments, too. And we can be used by God in this way. But when you're just a clanging cymbal, it's just annoying. And no one wants to listen to that. I promise if you, if I go down, if I go find a piano in any kind of store or anywhere and I start playing it, I'm, I'm going to have no idea how I'm playing it. And I'm just going to be, it's just going to be a sound. But if someone who knows God, if someone who knows how to play the piano gets on there, everybody's going to be listening. Now that does not mean that if you just know the Bible and if you just know how to play the piano, that actually means that you know God. You might just know how to play the piano. But people's lives are going to start changing around you. So if, if you have no love and you follow God, then you're just a clanging symbol. You must have love. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. So Paul says, I have all these spiritual gifts. I have all these things. I know Christ. I have all knowledge of the Bible. But if I have no love, it means nothing. It erases all the progress. Erases all the progress. And though I have I bestowed to all goods to the feed to the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, it profits me nothing. Again, Paul just continues to go on. Paul just continues to go to go on. He's saying, I do I do all these great things, but love, this is the most important thing that I have. Love suffers long, it is kind. Love does not envy, love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. It is, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not bro provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So when we have love for Christ, we endure because we love Christ. 
the whole goal of all of this is to be like Christ. The, the, the entire goal is to be like Christ because Christ is the only one who's worthy. We're called to be holy, just like Jesus was holy. We're, to, we're called to be the Christ on the earth. We're called to be Christ on the earth. You're not given the Holy Spirit to just go to Sunday to Sunday. You are given the Holy Spirit with power. First Corinthians 4.20 says the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. So if I'm speaking all these things, but I don't demonstrate the power that, and prove that I have the Holy Spirit in me through love and through works, it means nothing. It's about the inward part. It's about the inward part for other people. Jesus, it says that Jesus is the seeker of hearts. He's the searcher of hearts. He knows your heart. So you can, you, on the outside, you can be all perfect. You can be all Mr. Christian. But on the inside, it means if you're black and you're dead and you're whitewashed on the inside, just like Jesus said in Matthew 23, it means nothing. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. But whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away. All of these things will, they will cease. All these things will stop. The fail, love, true love endures all things. That's why when you have Christ in a marriage, marriage can't fail because your love for other people comes from Christ. Why do you think Christ said that none of them came out, they were, none of them, left my hand like none of them jesus has a, his hands are on us none of a, none of the disciples slipped out of his hand none of his people slipped out of his hand because they loved christ but it said that satan had already put in his, in judas's heart to betray jesus because judas jesus or judas didn't love jesus he loved money it said that he stole money from the disciples and Jesus says you can't be lovers of money and lovers of God. And all the disciples, no one knew who Judas, that Judas, Judas was the betrayer. They all thought it was himself. You can go look at this in the text. Do we really love Jesus? When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child, though I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put childish things, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror, but dimly. But then it's face to face. Now I know in part that but then I shall know just as I am known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But great, greatest of these, three, of these is love. So greatest of all the spiritual gifts and things that come with being with God is love. Seek love. Seek God. Rather than seeking love, seek God. Seek the kingdom of you. Matthew 6, 34 says, first seek the kingdom of God and all these things will come upon you. Are we seeking God? Are we seeking him with all of our face? According to Psalm 27, 8. In our heart, are we saying, God, I, I seek you? Are we growing fruit? Are we bearing fruit? Are we making disciples? Are people recognizing that Christ is in us? Let's let's ask you think. I um, let's ask um, ourselves this question today. So I just want to read a, a story, and this is something that Billy Graham wrote. And I was supposed to read this earlier. And so this is this is how you feed the flesh. This is how become you become stronger in God. An Esquimalt fisherman came to town every Saturday afternoon. He always brought his two dogs with him. One was white, and the other was black. On one Saturday, the black dog would win. And this is just a story. Okay, don't get mad at me. Okay, you're going to get it. Another Saturday, the white dog would win, but the fisherman always won. His friend began to ask him how he did it. So he would bet on his dogs and he would always win his bets. And his friend would ask him how he did it. He said, I would, I would starve one and feed the other. The one I would feed would always win. So how do we win? How do we love others? How do we do all feed your flesh? You have to feed it more than you feed your flesh. Feed, feed one dog more than the other. That's why we fast. So that when our flesh wants to do something we want, our spirit is more fed. We can bet on it. I can, 
firmly say that I can bet on my spirit when temptation comes. Hallelujah. So this is number five. And this is the first. The first, so one was, do you love God? Are you reborn? Number two. Number three, are you walking in the spirit? And number four, do we really love others? Number five, this is the final mark of the Christian. Are you doing what Jesus told us to do in Mark 16, 16? Are signs and miracles following you? See, if you're living a spiritual life, spiritual things should be happening all around you. And that's what Jesus said. Don't, don't get mad at me. Get mad at Jesus. He said, go into, pre, in the, into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, every person. Go, go preach to everyone. Go evangelize. Are we evangelizing? Are we obeying God? This is not a just maybe or if you want to. He says, go. It's a, it's a command, firm command. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. So when we follow God, these signs will also follow us. So as we follow God, these signs will, we're going to leave a trail. Like, so if I started dropping Cheerios on the ground, you would know where I was going. Just like Jesus, when he was walking to Jerusalem from Luke 9 to Luke uh, 19, there were signs, signs followed him everywhere. He healed, it said that Jesus healed everyone. Uh, Acts 10.38, it said he healed all who were oppressed by the devil. Acts 10.38 Acts 10, says that. And these signs will follow those who believe. So that these, there will be signs if you believe. And believe means to have believed. Con like have believed over and over again. There's not just one act of faith and, oh, Jesus is Lord. It's a continuous everyday thing. And to believe means to trust in. Are you trusting in God in every single area of your life? In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up new, they will take up new serpents. So you will cast out demons and speak new tongues if you really believe in God. They will take up serpents. If they drink anything deadly, it will no, by, by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. That's a guarantee. So if you lay hands on the sick on someone, they will recover today. But there's a thing about healing and we're, we're going to talk about this. It says your faith has made you well. So you have the power to heal. Jesus, he says this, Matthew 10, 1, he says he gives us the ability to heal and cast out demons. He gives us the authority to do so. Like Luke 10, 18 through uh, 20 says that I've given you the ability to trample on serpents and scorpions, but do not, do not rejoice because you, because the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. When we cast out demons, it's the it's the manifestation of the kingdom of God. It says that in twelve twenty uh, Mark, Matthew twelve twenty four and twenty six. Jesus says, "If I if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, by whom do your sons cast them out by?" When we walk in the spirit of God, miracles start happening. Our life becomes blessed when we're walking in the spirit of God. And that's a guarantee. John 10.10 10 says that I have not come. I've come to give life and life more abundantly. How are you doing, Rita? And this is what Ephesians 6, 10 through 13 says. And when we're a Christian, we're walking in the spirit of God, we're going to get opposition. Just like Paul got opposition, just like every other Christian got opposition. Jesus got opposition. Just look at Matthew 4. It says in Luke, it said that the devil waited, left him, flee from him to wait for another opportune time. So, so the devil's going to wait till you're weak. He's going to see. He's watching you. And we're at a constant war. You're, there's a constant spiritual war around us. But it says in Colossians 2.15, it says that Jesus has disarmed every principality and power. See, Jesus, didn't, he destroyed the devil. He took away his guns. So if there's a robber in my house, Jesus just took away his guns. But that does not mean the robber can still, he can't punch you. He can't throw fists at you. It says that we wrestle against, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. It says there's a wrestling match. There's a wrestling match happening in the spirit realm. And sometimes we're suffering because we, we don't know where the fight is. But Jesus, I'm here to tell you that Jesus has given you the, the authority and the power over the devil. Luke ten eighteen says, I saw this. I saw Satan fall like lightning. And that was not talking about Revelation 12 where Satan got cast out of hell or cast out of heaven. I apologize. It was the result of what the disciples did when they casted out demons. When we cast out demons, we destroy the kingdom of darkness. Someone say hallelujah. We destroy and we disrupt the kingdom of darkness with the spirit of God. So 
spiritual against for we don't wrestle against flesh blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places therefore take up the whole armor of god are, are we walking in the whole armor of god the whole armor of god is a spiritual thing are we it's a spiritual armor that we make sure that we're always wearing helmet of salvation you're saved breastplate of righteousness walking righteously being at right with god not being at war with god it said that we are amenity against god the sword of the spirit when the devil attacks you are you saying the word of god Jeremiah 23, 29 says, it's not my word like a fire and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. When the devil attacked Jesus, he used the word of God to destroy him. The shield of faith, knowing that God will quench every fiery dart of the wicked one. That does not mean that you're not, you're in a wrestling match, but you're going to become, come out victorious. The belt of truth, knowing that God loves you. Knowing if you have the belt of truth on, the, every lie the devil says to you, you will be able to acknowledge because the devil speaks lies. It says in Revelation 12 that our accuser was cast down from heaven. The accuser of our brethren. The devil is the accuser. He's going to accuse you of all your wrongdoings. But you have to know that you are forgiven and saved by Christ and by the blood of Jesus. It says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life to the death. They overcame him. Who is him? The devil. Overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the shoes for the preparation of the gospel. In all prayer and supplication, make sure you're praying for all your, your brothers and sisters at all times. Pray at all times in the spirit. Always be prepared to preach the gospel when you're outside. When There are the most random times where God will ask me to preach the gospel to somebody. And I always have to be prepared. Make sure that God's word is on your heart. This is what 2 Timothy... Oh, sorry. I'm ahead of myself. This is what Matthew 16 says. The gates of hell. He says, blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven has revealed this to you. And I, and I also say this to you. You are Peter. Say to you that you are Peter on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. God is the strong man that comes in. God is the strong man. So when you're, if you're struggling with the devil, God is the strong man. He comes in. How can you bind a strong man if you can, if you don't bring in the stronger man to purge all of his his possessions. But when you bring in a stronger man, you can bind the strong man. And that that's the spirit inside of us. And that has to do with our flesh, but it also has to do with casting out demons. And so this is the final thing. And this is in Second Timothy 3, 1 through 9. And then I'm going to go over this golden nugget that I was talking about earlier. Uh -oh. So I'm going to go over this in another video, but I want to talk about this. If you stuck around and enjoy this, you know what? I'll make a separate video about this. I'm going to go over this. This is very important. Second Timothy three, one through nine. This is what it says. So if you follow and you can check off all these things, you know that you are, you know, you're a follower of Christ, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times in this last days, this is right now. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of, uh, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into the households and make captives of gullible women, loaded with down with sins, led, abay, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They are never able to come to God. But when this is this last days. So if the, any of these things apply to you today and some of these things apply to me today and I need, to get, I need to get right with God. These are the six, five things that you, if you are able to check off, you can say that you're a legitimate Christian if you walk in these things. Now, I'm not saying that you have to be perfect, but I'm saying that the majority of these things you can say, oh yeah, I've done that. Oh, yeah, I do that. Oh, yeah, I spend time with God. Oh, yeah, I know God in the secret place. Can you say those things today? 
Hallelujah. Well, I hope you all enjoyed. I'm sorry we cannot get to the end, but um, I hope you all enjoyed. And uh, subscribe, like the video, share.